konferansımızın bu bölümünde e, çok önemli bir uluslararası konuğumuz var. Kendisi İngiltere'nin en önde gelen mimarlarından bir tanesi. E, İngiliz Mimarlar Kraliyet Enstitüsü Aray Biyay'ın 3 e, prestijli ödülünü kazanan tek mimar. E, 2012 yıllarında yılın mimarı, yılın konut mimarı, 2013'te Architects Journal tarafından yılın en iyi kadın mimarı ödüllerini almış bir isim. Kendisi bize kentsel konut konusu hakkında konuşacak. Konutla kentin bütünleşimi, e, kentsel hayattan kopmayan konut projeleri ve e, bunlarla ilgili irdelemeyi yapacak, sunacak. Panelimizin teması kentsel konut kısaca. Ben kısaca e, konuğumuzu Sayın Alison Brooks'u tanıtıp sonra kürsüyü kendisine bırakacağım. Alison Brooks, Kanada doğumlu. Waterloo Üniversitesi'ni bitirdikten sonra 1989 yılında İngiltere'ye taşınarak Ron Arad Associates ile 7 senelik bir ortaklık yürüttü. 1996 yılında Alison Brooks Architects Limited, Limited'i kurarak, Limited'i kurarak Helgoland'deki Etol Tasarım Oteli Hemset'teki VXO evi gibi ödülleri, ödüllü projelere imza attı. O yıllardan beri konseptsel tutarlılığı, deneysel formları ve özenli detaycılığıyla bilinmektedir. 2012 yılında az önce de belirttiğim gibi yılın evi, yılın altın ödülü, 2013 yılında yılın kadın mimarı ödüllerini aldı. Aynı zamanda ABA olarak e, bilinen e, ABA ile e, İngiltere'nin en prestijli ödülü, ödülü olan Sterling Prize'i Salt Evi ile Manser, Manser Medal'ı Rap Evi ile Stephen Lawrence Prize'i aldı. Ayrıca 2010 Audi Urban Future Award kapsamında ABA tarafından hazırlanan İşbirlikçi Devinim Şehri adlı proje 6. Venedik Mimarlık Biyaneli ve New York Şehir Festivali'nde sergilenmiştir. Mimarlığın toplum üzerindeki dönüştürücü rolüne olan inancıyla Alison Brooks günümüzde İngiltere'de büyük ölçekli konut projeleri yapım ve yenileme çalışmaları yürütmektedir. Alison Brooks CABE National Design Review üyesidir ve 2011 yılında RIBA Sterling Prize jüri üyeliği yapmıştır. Şimdi izninizle kendisini davet ediyorum. Alison, the floor is yours. Please. Good afternoon, everyone. I hope you can hear me. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here in Istanbul. It's my first time. And I have to say, I've been really looking forward to coming, I think, since I went to MIPIM about three years ago. And the best exhibitions and the most exciting projects, I think, by far, were the ones um, from Turkish developers and the developments in Istanbul. Somehow, uh, Turkey seemed to have missed the recession the rest of us were feeling really depressed, but um, Turkey looked really exciting. Um, and um, I also really have got a lot from listening to all of the speakers uh, this afternoon, especially um, uh, the overview of what's happening in the construction industry here and the skill and the productivity of the construction industry. And I think that actually Turkish contractors need to come to Britain and to start building some of our housing because it's far too slow and far too expensive when we, when we do it ourselves. Um, but I think we all agree that um, housing is actually a crucial cornerstone of our society. It's not just in terms of the physical environment, it's economic, it's social, it's physical and its infrastructure. And that's why I've called um, my lecture housing as cultural artifact and cultural infrastructure. I think it's, it's um, really the economy of cities and the kind of um, ability of a culture to kind of nurture its young and um, grow healthy, sustainable, um, aspirational, 
citizens uh, requires really good quality housing as the kind of bedrock. And I feel personally it's been a kind of uh, personal project of mine since I started my practice in 1996. I think it took me 10 years to really get a foothold in the door. It's very hard to actually compete and win housing projects. So I think every project I'll show you today I won from a competition because being Canadian I didn't have any connections in the UK and you just have to um, slog it out. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about the British housing crisis. Um, and I think it's not only in terms of quantity, there are a lot of statistics um, that are used talking about housing, but I think um, the qualitative crisis is as, is as severe as any other. And it's all about values, not just um, it's about ethics, ethical values and the culture of housing as an investment vehicle, which is not generally a long-term sustainable value, it's a short-term value. So there's a bit of a crisis there. I think it's not only a crisis of urbanization and urban transformation, it's also suburbanization and suburban transformation. I think um, particularly in the UK, the suburbs are never going to go away and it's very unfashionable as an architect to think or work in the suburbs, everybody wants to be urban because that's um, where all the action is. But there's actually a huge number of people who live in the suburbs and actually commuting from the suburbs um, is becoming more sustainable as our mobility infrastructure is more highly developed um, worldwide. Um, we all know about the environmental crisis, that's also um, our ambition to aim towards zero carbon construction. A lot of what I'm going to show you today use timber, timber as a construction material. And um, basically there needs to be new thinking. I totally support the agenda of this conference that um, new thinking, new ways of thinking about density, about mix of uses, that we shouldn't talk about housing on its own, there should always be other uses with the housing to make it a sustainable, walkable community, um, affordability, development appraisals. Behind every project I've done, I know that the people crunching the numbers are really not interested in the design usually, and that's a huge problem in the UK. Um, and basically um, to speeding up the release of land so that we can deliver homes so that the whole economic equation behind housing um, transforms to make better housing available to everybody. So that's, um, and that's the long-term cultural infrastructure that I want to talk about. Now, these two images are not my new whole housing project. This image on the left is of a mixed-use development I did for Urban Splash back in 2006 in Liverpool. And it got, a, um, got planning permission. It broke all the rules of the um, outline, which stipulated a nine-story big block behind this Victorian building and we proposed to actually shift the density around to make lower blocks that responded more sensitively to this Victorian building and then took that additional missing density and made a very slender 14-story tower. Now, even though this did, 14 stories is not very tall, even though this did break the, the planning rules, the planners listened and understood and accepted it and actually gave it a civic trust award even before it was built. So. Um, I think the, the one advantage of the British planning system is that through intelligent negotiations sometimes you can get around the rules um, in aid of density. This is also stone clad. We were trying to respond to the, the um, um, St. George's Cathedral, which is the main cathedral of Liverpool, which is the only kind of bit of heritage left in this neighborhood. And, and sort of express a new 21st century Gothic in a way, emphasizing the vertical and combining windows into kind of stretched vertical elements for each um, flat. So there's, there's a kind of a lot in this project that represents what ABA does. Um, this is an urban um, master plan for a prototypical urban extension to Mumbai that we did for Audi which is also representative of mixed-use, high-density, um, based around public spaces and a mobility network. 
Um, ABA, uh, just to give you a, a very brief overview, we're based in London. Our projects are mainly centered around London, um, some in Liverpool, Bath, Cambridge, Oxford, Folkestone. And then we've done competitions for various projects, Norway, uh, Finland, St. Petersburg, and earlier projects I did um, in Israel. A lot of these are um, housing projects and houses, but we're doing a major college building at Oxford University at the moment. There's a nice counterpoint to the housing. This is where we work, Highgate Studios in London, which is a, um, a warehouse, well, it's a collection of about eight warehouses with about a thousand people working in them. And this is another kind of precedent for me. Um, Housing, I think, should be like a warehouse. It should be really adaptable, really robust, high ceilings, lots of glass, and can take any use. So we have actually opposite, there's our office there, opposite our office, there's a blood transfusion clinic, and then there's a newspaper distributor and a software developer, and it's an amazing little community of um, all sorts of people in all sorts of industries. Um, I don't know if we should turn the lights down a little, a little more. Um, so I thought it's always good to, to define your topic quite clearly. So the word cultural artifact I think is really important to associate with housing because of its social and economic um, and environmental importance. and. So it's a term used in the social sciences for anything created by humans that gives meaningful information about the culture of its creators and users. And I think if you look back in time, you can see that basically every great city in the world is characterized by its housing. Um, Paris, London, no, Paris's Grand Boulevards or London's Georgian Squares, I'm sure Istanbul has its uh, heritage, neighborhoods, which are basically housing. And in a way, Place des Vosges in Paris is one of my favorite examples of what great housing should be. It frames a public space, it has a sheltered colonnade, and it has absolutely beautiful um, flats with very high ceilings and French doors. And it's a, it's a great asset for the city of Paris. It's one of its major tourist attractions, and yet it's housing. And um, this is another kind of cultural artifact for me in terms of housing. This is obviously a kind of pioneer ranch structure built in um, the Midwest in America. But I think for anybody from North America, the, the veranda or the porch is a hugely important um, it's a kind of icon, in a way, of the necessity of being social, of basically making your home have a threshold where you can invite people to sit on your porch and chat, and you can wave to neighbors, and it's protected from the elements, so you can use it in the rain and in the snow. And it's a, it's a kind of social symbol, and in a way, this kind of epic collection of roofs with this big roof and the dormer roof symbolizes domesticity and shelter. And this, this figure of the big roof and the, and the portico or the porch has also um, been a, I think is just part of my psyche and it, I bring it to all my projects. And this, uh, for example, is one of the um, housing estates in London that uh, London is sort of famous for its sort of horrible 1960s and 70s housing estates. And they're typically this construction, they're um, pre, pre, precast concrete um, that's failed structurally in a lot of um, cases and it fails environmentally and thermally and acoustically. And so London has literally hundreds and thousands of these estates with buildings like this that need re rebuilding. They basically need to be torn down when they're not structurally sound and whole neighborhoods reconstructed to replace this kind of what I think is a very poor example of a, of a kind of cultural artifact. It's symbolic of a kind of poverty of spirit and a meanness. Uh, it's not great to have four kids and live on the 15th floor of a block like that. 
So, um, and then of course this is another kind of cultural artifact, I hope, because it represents a, a kind of shift in the way we approach development in the suburbs. Um, and I'll talk more about this um, as I describe the project. This is an example of all of the, um, well, a lot of the work that my practice, ABA, is doing at the moment. Um, some of it is built. This is our, our building at Accordia in Cambridge that was part of the Sterling Prize winning team in 2008. Um, this is a 600 unit master plan in Dulles Valley, which is the northern fringe of London. This is 220 units in um, Ealing in London. This is 106 units in South Kilburn in London. This is a 28 unit mixed use scheme in Bath, um, again Ealing this is a competition scheme, and this is a 46 unit scheme in Cambridge. That's not all of our work, but basically all of these projects, except for um, this one, is in uh, some stage of either planning or pre-construction or construction. So yeah, we have about 2,000 homes actually um, on the drawing boards. So this fundamental, um, approach of housing is infrastructure, housing is city building, and I think architecture in itself is urbanism. You can't, especially when you're doing housing, you can't separate urban design. Every time you do a block of housing, you're affecting the city around you, and so the urban design, the master plan, has to be taken into account. Um, and this is just a little anecdote about the, um, what's happening in London. You can see here, the, this is the Athletes' Village from the 2012 London Olympics, um, which is a super high density, kind of terrible scheme that everybody hates, um, just north of the Olympic Park, and this is the Lee Valley um, River. And basically the London Development, um, Olympic Legacy Development Corporation sort of realized that this was a mistake. Um, it's too high, it's too dense, it has, it's too repetitive, has no character. And they staged a master plan for this sort of uh, 1400 home scheme to the north. The maximum height of this entire development is six stories. Um, and it's based on um, a kind of what's considered an urbane scale that relates to the parks in the tradition of Hyde Park and other London parks where the Grand Mansion Terrace um, frames and overlooks the park with family housing. And this is another huge issue in London. When we talk about housing, there's basically the shortage is family housing. It's not one bedroom flats. It's, I mean, there are two bed flats um, for young singles as um, we heard about earlier, but the main problem is family housing. There's nowhere for people with young children, starter homes, to live. And so most of the local authorities want to redevelop their 1960s estates, like this one here, the South Cuban estate that I showed you, one of these slab blocks, um, to provide a mix of one beds, two beds, and family, three beds, or even four bed units, all with outdoor amenity space, communal amenity space, Code for Sustainable Homes Level 4, so rainwater harvesting, um, sustainable urban drainage, like a huge range of criteria that you have to comply with. But the other really good thing is that this land is all owned by the London Borough of Brant, a local authority. And so they actually um, stage a design competition. They invite um, six architects from the London design framework to do a mini competition in two weeks um, with the team. And so all of the work I've got with Brent, we've, I've won through competition in this manner. And we teamed up with another practice to, to design this site, which is called Bronte and Fielding House, because that's the name of the two towers. And so this is the uh, podium, concrete podium with the tower that's there at the moment. And this is the classic urban figure ground plan that shows how basically the Victorian pattern of really good streets with terraced houses, that lots of them are actually broken up into flats now, but the sort of great tree-lined London streets that everybody loves, and then it's sort of blown apart here where in the 1960s and 70s, post-war, bit of post-war uh, destruction, 
um, was replanned as a kind of utopian um, um, urban design with houses in the air and parking podiums at their base. So our scheme basically proposes to restore the street with a long um, mansion terrace and a little point block to make this corner work and then our partner architects did these two buildings and in the center is a communal garden and our intention is to restore this street, Kilburn Park Road, as an urban boulevard. So it's as much about making really good streets as it is about making really good housing. Again, this is the Victorian um, um, original pattern of buildings with mews, terraces. And our sort of inspiration for our project is, is actually the London Mansion Terrace, um, typified by Maida Vale, which is a neighborhood in North London that's fantastically desirable. They're um, six or sometimes seven or eight story high um, terraced blocks, but these, each one of these bay windows is a through unit, so it goes from the front to the back of the building. There's, there's um, an entrance, every other double bay window, so entrances all the way along the street, flats on every single floor, and lots of character and detail and articulation at the roof line and balconies and covered terraces. So a very rich and um, obviously Victorian um, streetscape, but they're just over here, just off the map, not very far from this estate. Here I thought this would be quite interesting uh, in relation to the discussion that we had earlier about how everybody is um, well, the part of the problem with the planning process in London, why everything takes so long, is that whenever you design anything, you have to provide um, information and a strategy according to all of these different um, frameworks and guidelines. This is outside the building regulations. <laughs> um, there's the National Regeneration Framework, the Greater London Plan, the Mayor's Housing Design Guide, London Borough of Brent Unitary Development Plan, Local Development Plan, Statutory Planning Guidance. So you have to comply with all of those guidelines and restrictions in terms of height and density and, and then the housing mix and all of those things. Then, in, in your sort of design and access statement, you have to explain, you basically have to publish a book um, with written text and illustrations describing everything, your urban design concept, architectural, landscape, transport, sustainability, housing needs, community involvement, lifetime homes, accessibility, building for life, waste and recycling, ecology, daylight and sunlight, and acoustics. And that's not even the whole list. So whenever you design anything, you have to submit to the planners a document about that thick in words justifying everything you're doing in terms of its impact on the community, its impact on the environment, and um, how it will provide a sustainable development. So once you get through all that, <laughs> well, this is sort of part of it, but this is the, the kind of building block of our scheme, which is basically um, a six-story block, which reads as a kind of module that we're quite playful with our module with two-story high bay windows and, and dormers, um, reflecting the kind of articulation of the mansion terrace. But inside, we've made a completely different mix to the traditional Victorian terrace, which would simply have a, a two-bed flat on every floor going around a core. So we've added three bed flats on uh, maisonettes on the roof, one bed flats in the middle, two bed flats that go front to back, and four bed maisonettes on the ground floor. So basically you get a whole mix of demographics and income levels and types of people living in one of these modules. And this is another configuration we did for another scheme that has more three bed flats, more family units, and um, one beds and two beds in the middle. So it's a, it's a kind of um, easy way of accommodating a, quite a rich mix within a block. So what happens is this, this is a little bit like the tower that we looked at, but it's turned on its side um, to form a really strong street. And uh, the colors represent the different unit types. You can see there's lots of cores, so there's basically three units per floor which is quite low, but it's considered to be worth it in terms of what it offers back to the street. So lots of cores. Um, each 
each course serves 18 units, more or less. And this pink bit at the end is the affordable. So that's the social rent or um, social um, or shared ownership units. And this little building here is also uh, social rent, shared ownership. So it shows the, the kind of building block of the mansion terrace and how it works. And we've done other variations where you can embed um, parking underneath the landscape communal gardens at the back. So it's a highly, um, yeah, I've called it ground scraper housing. It's a highly adaptable block and um, quite efficient in plan. And you can see here uh, the very green context, uh, communal gardens. There is underground parking here under um, half, this half of the communal gardens. And um, this is all secured with gates, so it's a private um, garden. And then we've introduced a new public square here, the first new public square to be built in Kilburn in about 100 years. And, and a public boulevard that runs in between a taller element and, and the gardens to connect to this neighborhood um, on the other side of the road. So a lot of this is about working with patterns that, um, you know, once you get a really good pattern um, worked out, uh, it's about repetition, and repetition is often good. It creates rhythm and coherence and consistency along a streetscape. So our, our pattern was based on really big two-story high apertures that are either balconies or terraces or dormer windows. And you can see through from the street to the communal gardens um, through every entrance. And so, I mean, effectively, it's, it's a kind of quiet building. It's, it's a building you will never, never see from the front. You will only ever see it obliquely along um, this London street. And in a way, this building is forming a backdrop to this building, which is a listed church. And, and we're, t we're just trying to create a, a little bit of an animated facade that has a rhythm, but has a bit of grandeur and actually could become something else. It doesn't have to be housing. And this is a, a, a section of the scheme we did for Chobham Manor, where it was even denser with a parking podium and then muse houses and courtyard houses within the, um, within the courtyard itself. Oops. Um, so I'm going to talk, I'm going to sort of go backwards in scale. I'm starting with the bigger scale projects and I'm going to go right down to the very smallest origins in a way of the work we did at New Hall came from a one-off house that I designed for a private client. Um, and I've called this origins and obsessions because it was the beginning of a sort of process of in a way, exploring certain themes through the vehicle of a private house and um, of folding planes, of organic geometries, of a plastic as approach to space. And that's the great thing that a one-off house can offer you as an architect, is that opportunity. So this is um, the town of St. Lawrence Bay on the Malden Estuary. This is uh, basically the river that goes out to the North Sea. And here you can see a kind of classic English suburb that happens to be in the seaside. So basically, they just build suburban housing anywhere, even if it's the seaside. And the only sort of bit, bit of... Uh, culture and heritage that's left in this place is a little terrace of oyster fishermen's cottages. And this is a seawall because this is all in a floodplain. And so our, our um, initial invitation was to design a house to replace this kind of prefab 60s house here. And we were really excited and sort of inspired by these oyster fishermen's cottages um, adjacent to our site. And it was sort of the first time I, as an architect, sort of took on the idea of working with a pitched roof, um, the, the hipped roof, which is even worse than a pitched roof because it's symmetrical. And as a good modernist, I was trained to only ever do flat roofs on buildings. So we started working with the idea of combining, uh, combining typologies in a way. So the hipped roof vernacular cottage combined with the um, Greek or Roman atrium house. The client really wanted an atrium house with light coming in at the center. And just then the notion of an experimental beach house that sits lightly on the ground and allows um, the sea or floodwaters. This is a Marcel Breuer house. Um, 
to kind of become a hybrid, to sort of merge, to become an experimental new British seaside house as a kind of prototype for flood-proof um, housing. So here you can see the evolution from the, the sort of hipped roof uh, vernacular with the outrigger for the husking of the oysters, um, sort of um, manipulating the facade so that it becomes a bay window, a faceted facade to allow 180 degree views, um, further manipulations of the facade. I mean, this went a little bit farther than we went in the end, but you end up with a kind of um, freestyle hipped roof form which actually does really strange things with the eaves line. Um, we ended up with a sort of rationalized geometry like this, which looks rationalized from the roof. Um, and what it does, however, is give you an amazing array of sectional and spatial qualities inside the house. So everything from a sort of flat roof modernist section to a sort of floating atrium house. And this is the elevated... Um, um, platform that raises the house above the, um, the floodplain. So we ended up with a, a plan kind of like this. Um, so this is a portal frame. There are beams, sort of cross beams that allow a completely free span in the middle of the house, the atrium, bedrooms. Uh, this is on the first floor and study. And a kind of very permeable and open geometry um, so that you sort of flow from front to back and inside to outside seamlessly uh, and this becomes a kind of family room here. This is the construction uh, removable formwork. So this is on piles, mini piles, because there's running sand. There's tidal flow happening underneath this house. So the removable formwork allowed uh, this tray to be formed for the concrete slab and so this is what lifts the house above the floodplain to create this kind of landscape approach um, to the interior. This is hardwood cladding, hardwood timber cladding, Ipe, my favorite wood, um, tropical hardwood. And that lasts 200 years and is denser than concrete. So if you're going to use timber, I always suggest using a, a tropical hardwood. So um, very open plan, ground floor. Again, all of these sort of organic geometries, you don't really notice them when you're in the house because it's just about a kind of fluidity of space and openness to the sky. Um, very difficult to photograph. These are some of our earlier 3D model studies um, internally. And this is the house pretty much as it is today. Um, we designed this in 2002. But in a way, this, this experiment with the roof and also this experiment with the geometries of the facade just led to a much more open-minded um, approach to how housing construction can actually happen. It doesn't have to be a box, basically. The stair is a sculptural form. Um, porosity, and then pulling back the facade to create uh, balconies to allow views in, in both directions so that you can look back and see, see where your um, cousins are in, along the, the terrace of seaside houses. So this is its relationship to the sea, and it's in a way proposing a kind of new vernacular, but with a modernist tradition. So, in a way, some of these principles we brought to Newhall, um, but this is obviously suburban development. This had a uh, brief, it was a competition, a development brief for 76 units, and it was enabled by um, a landowner, the Moen brothers, who commissioned a master plan about 15 years ago to allow development of this, this greenfield site that they'd inherited. This is in the context of Harlow, which is a, is a very strange town to the north of London. Here's London, um, here's Harlow. It's about 45 minute drive from my office from here to, to Newhall, so it's not, it's not far at all. Um, but you can see how green, this is in a way the green belt around London, but actually most of Britain is green belts, as far as I can tell, <laughs> once you're out of the city. Um, and this is the original kind of utopian suburban master plan for, new, for Harlow, because Harlow was a new town planned in the 60s around the idea of zoning. 
So there would be a commercial center, which is basically a shopping mall um, in here. And then these are residential neighborhoods, ba each based around a school. And there are green fingers in between each, um, in between each neighborhood. And so it was a very restrictive idea of suburban development, creating really isolated pockets of suburban housing and basically a completely dead single-use um, core. So New Hall was farmland owned by these philanthropic landowners, um, John and Will Moen, and they commissioned this master plan for um, Basically, after a house builder had done a really terrible job on one of their pieces of land, they said, okay, we have to take control and make sure that we ha take stewardship over the land and ensure that the legacy is a good one and that every development parcel of about 100 units, so each of these is split up into around 100 units um, a time, is an experiment. The, the landowners actually sponsor and enforce the idea of of taking the housing design agenda forward with each plot that they release. So there was a competition launched for this lot here in 2006 and I invited the developer, uh, I actually invited three developers to join me in my design and development bid for, for this lot. And um, the third one, Lyndon Holmes, actually carried through with me. Um, this is just to give you an example of what's normally built in the suburbs. In the, I don't know if you have the same problem here in Turkey that when you drive out of a town, there's the, generally a, a kind of sort of no man's land of repetition of this kind of house, which is a sort of neo-vernacular or neo-Victorian house, just very badly built and with really bad proportions. And so in a way, we this master plan didn't really lead to a very inventive uh, use or efficient use of land and so we completely replanned it uh, based around the courtyard house so you can see instead of a single road in the middle um, and a road at either end and little houses with long gardens we sort of inverted it so it's a densely packed middle of courtyard houses and um, with villas on the outer fringes and then higher density apartment buildings in the corners forming gateways. So it's a, com it's a complete rethinking of the original master plan but it was very much supported by the landowners. And this, the DNA of, this, of the whole project is this principle which I also take to all of my um, housing projects now that instead of trying to always work within this typical British um, house builder's plot of 5 meters by 25 meters. So you have a little box at the front of the site and then you have a long skinny garden. And it's very English, but this idea of living in a sort of long narrow house is completely against all of my instincts as a Canadian. And um, reconfiguring that um, 125 square meter plot into a similar 125 square meter plot that's square. So, so you get two um, courtyards front and back and then a roof terrace and you get more usable livable um, area on the ground floor. So combined with that are the ideas that the house, the suburban house, could actually become a workspace, like an economically active place. So we were thinking, can the front of the house become a bit like a shop front, so the street feels like it's active during the day? Um, can we somehow draw on the, the really fantastically sculptural forms of the um, Essex barn, the roof forms and the dormers and gables? Can we maybe learn something from Mises' patio houses and Brancusi's fantastic totem sculptures and combine this all into a, a new approach to suburban development? So these were our, some, some very, not all of them, but some of our very early studies of how to make this T-shaped plan work and how to make these funny villas work and how to combine the whole thing into some kind of coherent assemblage of forms that related to each other even though there are different typologies and different um, values and uses. So this is the, the plan of the, of the house that we 
eventually refined and the most radical thing, one of the most radical things about it is this um, study here, is that this room, which is I think about seven square meters or a little bit under, is, is not a bedroom, it's a study. And in the, in the UK you're not really allowed to build rooms that aren't bedrooms or the kitchen or the living room and the dining room for a developer because those extra spaces don't acquire value in a development appraisal. Houses are valued based on number of bedrooms and not square meters and definitely not volume. So it took me about two years to save that study from being axed by the developer who just wanted to chop it off. Um, and then the central hall is key. The idea that the, the hall, when you walk into a house, the hall is actually uh, gives you a sense of generosity and space and light that um, creates your entire sense of what the house is about when you walk in. And it's a place where people spend a lot of time. So a very big hall leading through to the living room, which opens onto the courtyard, which opens onto the kitchen, and the covered porch. And then a uh, central stair, and you go up the stairs, a bedroom at the back with a cathedral ceiling, bedroom at the front. And then you can buy the house like this. And this house was put on the market at 250,000 pounds when it was first um, put on offer. So you can see the difference in value between a studio flat in London and a two-bedroom house in, in Harlow. And we designed it so that the third floor could be converted into another bedroom. So in fact, you would, were buying a two-bed house with a study that could be adapted into another bedroom when you bought one of these houses. And that was enabled by um, prefabricated timber construction. So no trusses in the roof. So this is how the plans pack together, which challenges uh, conventional notions of back-to-back -back distances and this is how the sections work. Um, so that's the living room, the entrance, master bedroom, cathedral ceiling, and extra room in the roof. So these were our early CGI's we did just in-house to sort of explain the need for the angled geometry because you probably notice that this is not a straight line, that the line of that facade angles back. And that's specifically to avoid the, the wind, looking out the windows directly at a brick wall. And it's absolutely crucial that that angle um, is there in the plan. And it also creates, um, creates this interesting geometry to the roof. And basically this prefabricated construction that you can see here, each piece of the facade came in a single piece. So a house would um, go up in about three days. Um, and this is the overall master plan where you can see these are only three-story high apartment buildings and four-story high apartment buildings, but it is the suburbs and you just can't um, build bigger um, bigger, higher buildings like that in this entire master plan. So this is the, the kind of overall scheme. Um, again, you can see the sort of density of the center of the scheme. And here is just a little diagram of how the, the orthogonal geometry becomes our slightly more open wing geometry and the roof space um, allows expansion. Those are the three plans. Again, the packing and this is how they come together oops, as a kind of um, mat. But you can see that no windows actually look directly out onto other windows. You can look across to your neighbor's roof terrace, but nobody seems to mind. Here, here are construction photos. You can see the roof came in big panels. Um, they, they come with a um, waterproof membrane already fixed to the timber sheathing. So you get a, a waterproof building site within three days. And this is the villa, again, a slightly more complex geometry. It's L-shaped, stair at the center, and a big open plan kitchen, living, dining, which is normally not accepted by house builders, and the study at the front. Upstairs, um, a big master bedroom with a balcony, and then another bedroom, and another bedroom at the front, and another bedroom that can be used up in the roof if you decide to expand into the roof. So this kind of adaptability of the scheme, the potential for the house to expand, is not, is not normally an offer in the UK housing market, and it's the reason why um, 
um, people have to buy so many houses in their lifetime. They have to buy seven times because they can't expand in uh, their own house. And so these houses were designed to provide that expandability. The timber cladding actually brought out some really nice craftsmanship from the, um, the carpenters. Um, this is the insulation waiting to go up into the, into the frame of the house. This is the marketing image of the, of the finished house. Lots of Christmas decorations, but it is actually the same space as that. <clears throat> Lots of windows, I think six windows. This is, you know, some of the interesting things that happen up in the ceiling spaces, um, in the double height space, and construction of the courtyard. Timber composite windows, these windows are Protec, they're made in Denmark, and they're the most fantastic um, composite windows. And now, they don't even make double glazed windows, they're all triple glazed, um, and they're affordable and beautiful. Um, just sort of important moments, being able to see out onto balconies, see down from the top floor to the ground floor via the staircase, and more construction shots. And this, this is a kind of rare shot because it shows the kind of compactness of the, of the courtyard. And then the overall streetscape and you can see through between every row of houses out to the wider landscape beyond. And these images you can see on our website, so I'll just skip through them uh, quickly. But they just show the, the kind of variation in street um, texture because half of the house is timber and half of it is brick. And this is for fire um, separation. And this is the all-important study. Most people who live at Newhall say that this room is the, their favorite room in the whole house because they have their desk in there, their computers, their all of that stuff that you need in your home office and usually there's you know one of the kids is like gaming in the living room and somebody's working in the kitchen and somebody's working in the study and so these rooms do actually act as shop fronts for people who are um, working at home all day if I pass my time okay I'll just skip through so open foyers staircase courtyard the whole series. So I think, um, yeah, I, I mean, I can end here. If have I, if, have I run out of time? There's more. <laughs> Maybe we should get some questions from the audience. Vakit ilerliyor. Bir başka çok kıymetli konuşmacımız daha var. Elisine sorularınız varsa onları alalım birer ikişer. Soru tamamlayalım bu oturumu. Sorusu olan var mı? Mimarlarımızdan. I'm asking whether they have questions or not. Sorry, I just didn't get a chance to complete. Would you like to spend two or three minutes more to complete? No, no, no. It's okay. I think it's fine. Yeah, all the. Mikrofonu uzatabilir miyiz orada beyefendi? Şurada. Biraz hareketli olalım. E, i̇smim Nizami Gürol, mimar. Ben evlerin metrekarelerini ve evlerin metrekarelerini ve fiyatlarını öğrenmek istiyordum. Yeah, the square meters. Yeah. Okay. The I don't exactly know the prices now, but the original prices, yeah. The two bed courtyard house was oh it's very loud. It was ninety two square meters. And the three bed was a hundred and twenty one square meters. Okay. 
then the three bed um, villa was 117 square meters and the four bed villa is 132. So the, you know, there, um, the two bed courtyard house is six square meters over the London Housing Design Guide, but the three bed is 15 square meters over. I mean, basically it's the study adds the square meters and then when you go up through the roof it's the stair and the room which adds um, additional square meters but basically they're generous they they are big for British standards I don't know how they relate to um, Turkish standards for for suburban houses but um, they were oversized and again it was something that I had to fight for and uh, the landowners the Moen brothers of Newhall projects really supported because everybody in principle supports the idea that you shouldn't have to move once you buy a house and what allows you to stay in a house is um, space and volume. Um, probably the volume is dramatically bigger than a standard house because the floor to ceiling heights are 2.6 meters and that's something that everybody comments on when they go to the houses is just the quantity of light and uh, volume. Arkada bir soru var. Arkada, sizin arkanızda. Uh, hello, my name is Yeltsin Korkmaz. Uh, I'm really sorry about this cutting your presentation. I just want to hear your last words. Um. Well, I think um, I think the most important thing that oh, there's so many important things. The idea that that housing is infrastructure, I think, is really, really important. That we shouldn't, like, in a way, it's subject to the market economics, but it's being asked to deliver lifelong homes and builds the fabric of our cities. And so the more care and thought um, that goes into the design to make these, to make housing more sustainable and more adaptable and more long-term, um, the more value it has for society. And I think um, if you think of housing as infrastructure like utilities, like sewers or drainage or water or electricity, then there's no question, you know, government and society would invest in it. Like a utility, you don't mess around when you build a canal or you build a, a flood defense or... Like the Dutch, they basically plan their housing because they've, they've, they've built the land and they've built the flood defenses and so they plan the housing as if it's infrastructure for their whole society. Um, so the, the rules governing space standards are are fixed, space standards are really generous, the construction is really robust. And and then th there's room for design and intuition and character because the kind of groundwork is solid. You know, there's a kind of robust and intelligent framework for the housing to get off the ground. And then there's scope for architects to do really interesting things. Um, formally and with uh, brick and cladding and materials. And it becomes sort of uh, like the backdrop, the kind of canvas for life, um, kind of the way Aldo was talking about and some of the other speakers, that, that you want housing to just create really good places, that you don't have to notice it that much. It just needs to be really good. <laughs> it needs to be there and last a really long time and allow um, light and volume and kind of sociability to happen. It's, it's a kind of catalyst for community building and um, and so this is where the conflict with housing as a it has an investment vehicle really starts to uh, um, conflict with the whole agenda the whole social and kind of ethical agenda of housing and this is the the biggest problem we have in London at the moment which was also mentioned by some of the other speakers is when you have foreign investors coming in and speculating on the price of land and the value that their investment is going to go up in the next 10 years that whole idea of infrastructure and community and a kind of civic infrastructure um, for the local population is lost 
And I think this is a fundamental issue that I think architects should be vocal about and uh, work with their politicians and with the construction industry as a whole to kind of shift to shift that so that we're building for future generations and not for the next, um, you know, uh, financial report. So the brothers. Hello, my name is Hussein Egele again. Uh, you are an expert in house planning. I wonder what kind, uh, what kind of a house you're living in at the moment and what's your dream house? Um, I often get that question because I've also designed a lot of private houses for clients. Um, I live in a, in a Victorian semi-detached house built in 1899 um, in very close to that housing estate project I showed you um, in Kilburn, or Queen's Park in London. So it's, it's five stops away from Oxford Circus on the tube, but it's in a classic Victorian late 19th century suburb. You know, the density is about 45 dwellings per hectare or something. Um, I don't want to live in my own experiment. I don't want to live in an old experiment, if you know what I mean. I, I, um, I mean, other than the fact that I don't have time, I kind of see um, private houses as a vehicle for testing ideas that need to be taken somewhere else. <laughs> they need to move on. And so I don't want to be trapped in an old idea that I had that I've moved on from. Um, so I haven't really done anything <laughs> to my it's, it's more or less uh, in the, the state that the last um, owner left it in, who was a, 19, who was a dentist, who, re, who sort of redid the house in the 1950s. So it's, it's um, I don't know, I've kind of learned to love the 1950s remake of, an 80, of a Victorian house. It's got its own kind of personality. <clears throat> Edison, have you got any um, invitation from the Turkish construction firms or from the Turkish development firms yet? Not yet. Not yet. <laughs> you will. <laughs> After this presentation. Thank you very much. Hanımefendiler, beyefendiler, Edison Brook. Thank you. Thank you very much.